Thank you. So, how's everyone doing? So thank you very much for all sticking around. It's my absolute pleasure to be here for the inaugural GopherCon. Um, this talk is concurrency made easy. Uh, if you haven't, <laughs> no one's met me before. My name is Dave. Uh, I, as Audrey said, I'm a Hubber enthusiast and programmer from Sydney. Um, and if I'm completely honest, this slide is here so that the, the, the timer starts in Keynote correctly. So for my talk, I want to continue with the theme of concurrency that some of the previous speakers have touched on. And as someone who's had the privilege of talking to programmers who are considering adopting Go, I find that a common motivation amongst many of them uh, is, is the, they want to take advantage of this parallelism that's inherent in our modern hardware. And similarly, in, in, in my self-appointed role of a developer advocate, uh, when I meet people who've learned Go, one of the more common things they say after they've been writing Go for a year or so are kind of things like this. I mean, show of hands, does this resonate, do these quotes resonate with anybody? One person at the back, you're, you're honest? Yeah, okay. Now, if you've learned Go formally, like maybe you've taken a training course or you've studied it in a book, you might have noticed that the concurrency section is usually towards the back. I mean, th this is certainly true of my own material. So clearly there's a disconnect between the concurrency primitives that the language offers and the expectations of some, maybe many, who come to the language for exactly those reasons. I mean, there's kind of a dichotomy. The headline feature of Go is our simple lightweight concurrency model. And as a product, like the language really sells itself on this alone. But on the other hand, we have this narrative that concurrency isn't actually as easy to use as we make out. I mean, otherwise, authors and trainers wouldn't make it the last chapter in the book. And we wouldn't look back on our formative efforts, um, perhaps with regret. And this is kind of a shame because I, I believe that the Go concurrency model is the, one of the simplest available. And more importantly, the requirement for programmers to embrace parallelism in, available in our hardware has never really been more acute than it is now. So with this as a background, I want to spend my time today talking about some ideas that could make concurrency easier to use not just for newcomers, but perhaps for all of us. So let's start in the obvious place. I mean, we're talking about the Go keyword. Here is our simple web 2.0 hello world program. Um, show of hands, just yell out. Can anyone spot a problem with it? At the back, yell it out. Never exits, Never exits. okay. Close, yeah. Pardon me? What? Yes, there. This right here? Absolutely, that's, that's right. Four is an infinite loop, this empty for loop. So it's going to block the main Go routine because it doesn't do any I.O. It doesn't wait on a lock. We don't send or receive on a channel or otherwise communicate with the scheduler. And as the runtime is, we can say, mostly cooperatively scheduled, this program is going to spin fruitlessly on a single CPU, and maybe it'll end up live locking the program. It could starve the Go routines doing actual work. So how could we fix this? Here's one suggestion. Um, I heard someone laugh down the back. This is, this is quite a common solution, I see, that people come up with. Um, and I think it's symptomatic of not understanding the underlying problem. Now, if you're a little more experienced with Go, you might write something like this. The empty select here uh, will block forever. I mean, that's a useful property, because now we're not spinning a whole CPU just to yield to the scheduler. 
But as I said before, this is just treating the symptom, not the cause. Um, so I want to present to you a different solution, hopefully one that's occurred to you already. And that is that rather than run, listen, and serve in a go routine, leaving us with the problem of what are we going to do with the main go routine, we simply run, listen, and serve ourselves. So this is my first suggestion. If your go routine can't make progress until it gets the result of another, oftentimes it's going to be simpler to just do the work yourself. And this often coincides with eliminating a lot of state and state tracking and channel manipulation that is required to plumb the result from that go routine back to yourself. Now I've chosen to make this my first example because compared to my next, uh, it's not only shorter, but perhaps it's more profound. Because many Go programmers overuse Go routines, especially when they're starting out. Now, the previous example showed using a Go routine where one wasn't really necessary. But of course, this is Go, and one receives no points for doing only one thing at a time. And indeed, there are many instances where you want to exploit the hardware parallelism you have available to you. And so, to do that, we must use GoRoutines. Now, in this example, which is taken from a prior version of GB Vendor, um, we're attempting to fetch a set of dependencies in parallel. So the goal of this restore function is repos represents a set of remote git repos, effectively. And so we're trying to fetch as many as we can in parallel. Now, give you a minute to look at this code. Does it look reasonable? Can you spot any problems? Show of hands, who thinks it's perfect? Can anyone see a problem? With it, yeah? You want to yell it out? We're trying to read from a closed channel. Okay, read from a closed channel. We'll come back to that. As a code reviewer, one of the first things I'd be drawn to is this interaction between this section here where we're deferring the call to wait group dot done and then we're retrieving a value off the semaphore. And in the main go routine, we're, we're waiting on that wait group be de-incremented, and then we're closing the semaphore. Was that what you noticed, or was that something else? OK. So my question for you is, the close of this same channel happens after wait group dot wait. They happen in sequence, so we know that it happens afterwards. And we also know that the close of semaphore happens after the call to wait group dot done, because this, this statement won't return until all the, the wait groups have been called done. However, this received from the SEM does not necessarily happen before this. So can, this, can the close of SEM cause a panic? Yes or no? Who thinks yes, it could cause a panic? A few people? Who thinks no? Even less. <laughs> so as it happens, no, this can't cause a panic. One of two things will happen. Either the receive from SEM happens before the close, in which case the receive from SEM drains a value from the channel, and then we mark it as closed. Or the close of SEM happens first. So what does receiving from a closed channel return? Anyone? I heard a few people say zero value. When does it return it? How long does it take? Immediately. Immediately. Right. Now, the point of talking about this is that what well, turns out that these, are, these, two, these two outcomes are both safe. We had to spend some time thinking about it. The logic here in this code is, is unnecessary uh, necessarily confusing. So if we simplify the defer statement and reorder the operations, we get something like this. Now there's no question 
in which order the operations are going to occur. Um, in the program, at the top, we add to the weight group, and then each time through the loop, we push a value onto the semaphore. Uh, when, when the go routine is done, we take a value off the semaphore, and we reduce the weight group count. Um, and then in the main go routine, we're just waiting on that, that weight group count to drop to zero. So now there's no ambiguity what's going on. So the suggestion that I draw from this example is always release locks and semaphores in the reverse order that you took them. At best, mixing up the order, as we saw previously, um, generates kind of confusing code. We have to think about it. We have to, think, we have to re reason through all the possible states. And at worst, mixing acquire and release logic is a, is a sure path to deadlocks. So now we've rearranged the program a little. We can ask another question. What is the reason for closing the semaphore channel? I mean, if a restaurant closes, it doesn't remove anyone seated at the, at the, ta at the table. It's just an indication that the restaurant isn't taking any new passengers, sorry, any, any new customers. So similarly, channels are not resources like files and network so sockets. The close signal doesn't free a channel. It just marks that channel as no longer accepting new values. Now, in our example, nothing is waiting in a select or a range loop for that closed signal. So we can just remove the close, the close of semaphore. It's not necessary. So closing a channel is a signal to its receivers that it's no longer accepting new data. Little more. Closing a channel isn't necessary to free a channel. You don't need to close a channel to clean it up. And speaking of semaph semaphores, let's look a bit closer at how SEM is used. So the role of SEM is to make sure that at any one time, there's a cap on the number of fetch operations running. We don't want to start them all at once. We want to gate them. Uh, when I gave this talk, uh, when I gave this talk in Melbourne, I said the number four was probably about as much as the Australian internet could take. <laughs> but if you look closely, SEM isn't guaranteeing that there are no more than four fetch, fetch operations running. It's actually doing something else. Can anybody spot it? Yes, at the back. It's only allowing you to dispatch four Correct. So, Rather than guaranteeing there are no more four, four operations running, it's actually stopping there being any more than four go routines running at one time. So assuming there are enough values in repos, let's just assume that there's quite a few to fetch. Each time through the loop, we're going to try and push the number one onto the SEM channel, and then we fire off a fetch go routine. So what happens when we get to the fifth iteration in this loop? It's quite likely that we'll have four go routines running, or at least have been scheduled to run. There's no guarantee by the scheduler that a go routine is run immediately or put on a backlog. So there'll be four already in train. But on the fifth iteration, the main loop is going to block here before we start the go routine until there is space in the semaphore channel to push another value. So rather than spawning, uh, len of repos number of go routines and letting them fight it out amongst themselves for a semaphore, this loop is actually going to proceed at the rate at which fetch operations complete. Now, it doesn't matter so much in this example because the whole of restore blocks until we fetched all of the repos that we need. But there are many situations where the calling code expects to be able to set up this work to happen in the background promptly and then return. So the most straightforward solution to me is to move the taking of the semaphore inside the go routine. So now all the fetch go routines will be created straight away. We just go through this for loop very quickly, creating those go routines. And they'll negotiate amongst themselves for 
at a place on the semaphore channel. And so a recommendation from this, perhaps, could be that although goroutines are cheap to create and schedule, the resources they operate on, files, sockets, bandwidth, disk I.O., are often scarcer. This pattern of using a channel as a semaphore to limit work in progress is quite common. But to make sure that you're not unduly blocking the code trying to offload that work, uh, a good, a good idea is to acquire the semaphore when you're ready to use it, not when you expect to use it. So hopefully we've got all the bugs out of this program. However, there is one more obvious one that I haven't talked about, and it's quite a serious one that I think catches almost all, all Go programmers out at least once. Can anyone spot it? OK, yeah? If multiple uh, routines uh, error on the patch. Uh... OK, that's not the answer. But I'll come back to that. Yep, at the back, Aditya. Uh, you're not closing, or rather, you are closing on the repo. Oh. So that's, that's also a good, a good one. So there's more than we plug in this program. That's not it. The repo variable. Is that what you thought? Yeah, the repo variable is outside. Right. Yes, exactly. The variable repo in our for loop here is being captured by this anonymous go routine here. That, that variable repo and this one are the same variable. So as you said, each time through the loop, we're going to be updating the value of repo. So most likely, all those go routines are going to end up fetching just the final value. And as you spotted, more importantly, this is a data race. Because we have one Go routine up here changing the value of repo, and we have many others reading it concurrently. This is the, the textbook definition of a data race. Now, this is one of the classical paper cuts, which I think many of us have learned the hard way. And you might think that rewriting the program like this would solve it. So it's a show of hands. Have I fixed the race? No one's going to fall for that. Have I not fixed the race? Exactly. Why is that? Just yell it out. Exactly. It's the same thing. Rather than cat closing over repos, I'm just closing over the value of i, which is going to be incremented in the loop. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, in my opinion, the cause of this common error is the interaction of three things. Anonymous functions, lexical closure, and go routines. And it's, it's the combination of all three. There's nothing wrong with these features uh, by themselves, but it's the combination. Now, it's really cute to be able to write an anonymous function and execute it in line like we do here. But then the reader has to consider the effect of lexical closure. And something else that uh, seems to challenge quite a number of programmers that come to Go is this idea of nested scopes. So instead, what we have to do is ensure that a unique value of repo, or i, whichever we choose, is passed to each fetch Go routine when they're invoked. This is, there's a bunch of ways to do it. This is one. So now there's a new repo declared inside the Go routine and we just pass the ith value of repo to it. So a recommendation that I draw from this is avoid mixing anonymous functions and go routines. And apply my own advice, replace the anonymous function with a named one and pass all the variables, variables to it that we need. This is not a very pithy example because it's work, work, we're working from one place to another. So there is quite a lot of parameters passed there. But the result is that we've eliminated the, the possibility of lexical capture. And so we've eliminated that data race. It just can't happen. Well, we know the answer. Uh, 
So after this review, we've refactored the code to make a clean separation between the function that's producing the work, our restore function, and the function that's actually processing that work, now called worker. So we fixed all the issues with this code. Um, I've heard two, I've heard two people say something, so there's at least one or two left. Let's have a look at the, the core of the worker function that's calling fetch and handling the error right there. Can anyone see a problem with this? I think someone yelled it out before. You were down the, down the back. Yes? Um, it's not about the closed channel. I think you had it. Uh, it's about blocking uh, the multiple uh, instances of worker uh, trying to push an error. OK, so for the recording, what would happen if more than one, say, say the networking just went down, not here at Google, but perhaps in Australia, and all the fetches failed at once, what's, what's going to happen? Deadlock. Someone said deadlock, yeah. So each of the errors is not going to be nil, and so each of these go routines is going to try and push an error onto the error channel to report what's happened. Let's have a look at the declaration of error chain. What's its capacity? Just one. But our semaphore channel has capacity of four, so it's going to be at least four jobs running at once. And so we could have up to four of them trying to write. Is that actually correct? Could there be up to four? How many, how many possible error values could we have to send here? Over here? The number of repos. The number of repos, yes. Every single one of them can fail. No? No? OK, um, I'll come back to that. So as, as someone said over there, this is going to lead to a deadlock. Because we, if we can't push onto the error channel, we, we, if we can't push onto the error channel, we can't release the semaphore, we can't release wait group dot done, and so we can't restore current return. So I want to introduce this idea that before you start a Go routine, you should always think about how and when it will exit. Now, how do we go about applying this advice to the example? Um, I like to do it by working backwards and ask what ways this Go routine can exit. This is a, in this example, it's pretty simple. We know that the Go routine starts with the worker function. So when worker exits, when worker returns, the Go routine will exit. Now, because this function contains a defer, even though this statement occurs first, we'll consider it as the last statement. Um, if there are multiple defers, you consider them with a last in, first out strategy. Wait group dot done is a single signal to the wait group, which is another kind of semaphore, that the task is done. Wait group dot done never blocks. So the statement will not prevent the worker returning. The penultimate statement is this receive from SEM, which can't block because we couldn't get to this point unless we've been able to push a number one onto that semaphore channel. Now, the value that we take off that channel may not be our number one, it may be somebody else's, but we are guaranteed uh, to receive a value so this statement won't block. So this just leaves us with the call to fetch. And for argument's sake, let's assume it's well written, it has appropriate timeouts, it is guaranteed to return at some point. Now, if there's no error from fetch, we're not going to enter the if condition. And so we're going to drop down to the semaphore, which we've talked about, go to the defer, we're done. This is going to exit cleanly. If there is an error, we must place it onto the error chain before we can go through this exit behavior. So if we want this to always succeed, what is the capacity we should give to Erichan? Someone set it down, down the back earlier. It's got to be the len, len of repos. As I said, it's got to be the len of repos. This will at least guarantee that if every fetch were to fail, there will be capacity to store the error without deadlocking. However, there is another option. Now, if you look here, we see that restore 
only returns one error value, um, which it reads from the error chan on the last line. So rather than creating space for all possible errors, we can just use this behavior of the caller to say, we only want to handle the first error, the first one that happens for some condition of first. So if, there, if the error is not nil, we try to push it onto the error chan, but if that operation would block, we fall through to the default behavior and just discard it. There are probably a bunch of different ways you would handle this strategy in your own code, and it really depends on how you propagate that error up. You might merge it into some multi-error. You might choose to return a slice of errors. It really depends. But in this case, we know that restore is only capable of returning one value. So anything that happens after that first error, we can just discard. And as a bonus question, which we'll answer in the questions, the read from error chan in restore is guaranteed to never block. Um, even if all calls to fetch succeed, how does this work? You can answer me after the questions. So the name of this talk is Concurrency Made Easy. It's my nod to Rich Hickey's fantastic paper, Simple Made Easy, in which Rich Hickey demonstrates that the, the ideas of easy and simple are not synonyms. They're in fact completely orthogonal. And given that I've just spent the last 20 minutes discussing six bugs in a 20-line program, I don't think I can argue in any, in any way that concurrency is simple. I mean, a concurrent system is inherently more complex than a sequential one. Now, what I've pitched you today are not patterns to be applied in specific cookie-cutter situations. Instead, what I want you to take away from this presentation are general suggestions that I've illustrated. Principles, if I can be so bold. They're principles, not rules or patterns. Principles which give you a framework to answer your own questions when you're writing concurrent programs. And hopefully by applying these principles, you can make your time writing concurrent code, if not easy, at least hopefully a little easier. Thank you very much.